Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 6, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but seriously, this week, I do mean it. I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew so we can make sure we get everything covered. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this free endorsement. PepsiCo, if you're out there, give me a shout out. Red Bull said I was too fat. All right. All right, this is Flame and Scream. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. You read the book? You liked the book? If you didn't like the book, I don't know why you'd be here, but <laughs> if you did like it, uh, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. Put me up a review on Amazon.com. Got a couple of new reviews up there, so I want to thank you for that. Um, as they say each week, or often say, I should say, uh, ad nauseum, <laughs> sometimes people just, uh, they're malignant, and um, they'll put up a review about the other reviews, which is the stupidest thing in the world. If I had that much idle time, I just, I, I certainly wouldn't be doing that. You can't hear me? Can you hear me now, Martin? <laughs> um, I'm showing the sound working on my end, so... Uh, Check your speakers, Martin. Okay. Sometimes a squirrel can be uh, across the wire between me and you. The good thing is, <laughs> the good thing is, uh, thank you guys for the feedback. Uh, the good thing is, this is being recorded, uh, and the recording here is very robust. Okay, what are we talking about? Well, I want to stick with sticking with the plan. And uh, I kind of unearthed some things, kind of backed into a couple things, mostly by accident uh, this morning and recently. I don't want to share those things with you. So I want to keep talking about allowing the portfolio ebb and flow to control your portfolio. And uh, a few things that kind of dovetailed into that is, uh, is dead money. Uh, so I have a dead money report. And I have something that I found just absolutely fascinating, and I hope you enjoyed as much as I did when I found out. But even if you had a crystal ball that would predict market directions, at least in this one particular case, it would be kind of interesting to see what would happen. And we're going to explore that in just a minute. Phil said it's a dead cat getting his revenge. In this morning's column, I talked about the proverbial dead cat bounce. Um. I think it's important to continue to talk about bow ties. I don't want to talk about the angle of inflection there. I'd rather just show you than tell you. So let's just hop into that. Now, last week and then I think a couple of weeks prior, we talked about major bow ties and their importance. And they are very important. Whenever you get a, a bow tie off an all-time high in a market or at least a multi-year high or a multi-year low, uh, it could be an important signal. And I know I've beat this, this chart to death, but... Let me just show you real quick, those of you who are new to this. You get a bow tie off of multi-year lows or ideally all-time highs or all-time lows, which hopefully we don't see one off all-time lows in the um, in the S&P. We'd have a lot more problems than uh, just trying to figure out how to trade. Anywho, uh, you had a major buy back here after the bear market, and you had a new bull market that uh, occurred. And you had a major sell then. And this buy was a little late. Keep in mind, this is a weekly chart. We're going to look at dailies here in just one second. He did have a minor sell in the weekly, which was kind of interesting. But by the time it triggered, or I don't even know if it did trigger, the market had already flipped around and gone right back up. But minor because it's only about a one-year high here. When you get up towards these brand-new highs and bang out new highs and the market begins to roll over, that's when a transition is at is important. And the reason I'm repeating this is because you got to remember when a market's making an all-time high, anybody who's ever bought the market is happy. But as soon as that market begins to deteriorate, especially the Johnny Come Latelys, uh, those who have bought near the peak, they tend to be the the worst traders, the fickle money and the hot money, however you want to look at it. And they tend to be the first to bail out. So the last in tend to be the first out. But that move often begins to exacerbate I guess that's the word, 
and more and more people get uh, get encouraged, I guess would be a good word, to dump their positions. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll wait for that market to bounce. And with a transitional setup, you have a market making a major, major high, begins to sell off. And they're like, oh, geez, as we say in Fargo, okay, oh, geez, I better get out of this market. But wait a minute, it's beginning to bounce a little bit. Now might be a good time to get out. Let me just wait to see if this bounce continues. And if the bounce is kind of anemic and begins to roll back over, then all of a sudden they're trapped in the market. And this is why with a transitional setup, we don't have the luxury of waiting for that nice deep pullback. Okay, So that's what bow ties look like. Now, this is a daily chart. Keep in mind that was a weekly we are a long ways away from bow tying down on the weekly chart. And the reason I always show that weekly is it helps to kind of um, give you a bigger picture perspective. I guess this is the best way of looking at it. So once, and hopefully I'm wrong on that, I, I should say if. I don't want to use the word once, but if we bow tie down on the weekly chart based on the last 30, 40 years, it could be a fairly major signal. Keep in mind that when a market makes a top, it will have one of these transitional setups. Every top, I can guarantee you, will have some sort of transitional setup in it. But not every transitional setup will turn into a top, but it does pay to pay attention. And that's why I want to drive the point home and I want to spend a lot of time talking about this today. And I'm going to keep talking about it until conditions improve. Uh, market hit a brand new high right here, all-time high. This is the uh, spiders. I just happened to grab the spiders. The S&P 500 works too, the um, cash market. And this is the 50-day moving average. And what I want to show you here is when you get a sharp angle of attack of the bow ties against that 50-day moving average. And one other thing that's kind of cool is notice how they all came together right at that 50-day moving average. It kind of makes a spider looking, uh, a spider bow tie. Hey, look at that, a spider bow tie. I didn't even, you would think I would rehearse this stuff, right? <laughs> so uh, it is kind of interesting. Now, keep in mind that moving averages do have lag, but they can be a pretty good indicator of what's going on in price, to alert you what's going on in price. And the fact that they came down so fast and hit this 50 on such a, uh, a sharp angle that suggests that a fairly major cycle at least a short to somewhat intermediate term cycle has changed and that's why we're using these multiple moving averages this is the short term cycle of two weeks this is the somewhat intermediate term cycle of one month but it's front weighted okay because it's an EMA and this is a 30 day EMA which gives us about six weeks worth of trading and it's front it's front weighted because it is an EMA and the reason I like the EMAs on the longer term uh, time periods is because they're going to turn a little bit quicker than waiting for that uh, generic average to turn. But what's kind of fascinating is, as I often preach, if all you did in the markets was trade on the side of daylight, meaning that this is the moving average and here's your low, okay? If all you did was trade, you're going to stay long as long as the market's above that moving average and you have daylight above that moving average and you can stay short if the market is below the moving average and the highs of the market are below the moving average. If all you did was that, and I'm not saying do it mechanically, but I'm saying if all you did was pay attention to that longer term moving average to give you a little perspective, I think you would do okay in the market. And as you can see, we had daylight all the way up until here. And if you back this chart way out and go and look, at, especially go look at the NASDAQ, and we'll take a look at that in just one second, too, when we'll we get to the charts, you'll do very well. The question is, is the longer-term moving average a simple one? This is the 50-day simple. And the reason I have the 50-day simple in here is because the whole world watches the 50-day simple moving average. Okay. Now, you probably notice that I'll never put a moving average on my chart or rarely put a moving average on my chart. The market's just going along its merry way, going higher and higher and higher. I really don't care too much about them as long as the market's in a trend. It's when they begin to make a transition and trend that I like to throw the moving average in. Okay? Simple. That's I M P L E. Okay? That's 50 day simple. So when the market begins to make a transition, I like to see what's going on 
with the moving averages. Or sometimes if a market begins to go a little sideways, I like to throw a moving average in to see what's going on. And sometimes you get a market that goes sideways, kind of comes up, and makes this gradual kind of rollover. And to the naked eye, even though I preach 99.9% .9 of the time, don't put any indicators on your chart, but to the naked eye, you might not have noticed that this market is rolling over. You might be focused on the fact that it started here, and now it's up here at Y, from X to Y, and that looks like a pretty good trend. But sometimes if you put the moving averages in, especially the bow tie moving averages, you'll see that maybe this market has begun to roll over. And then when you look at it more closely, you're like, oh, wait a minute, okay? Yes, it has begun to roll over. So that's when I like those moving averages. The point I want to make today is when you have this sharp angle of attack against the 50, okay, you can see this is a pretty sharp angle of attack down. It could be a fairly significant signal. It means that the tide has changed very quick. And you could just eyeball this market move and say, well, that's a pretty serious market move. And then if you didn't know anything, then you could dust off your net net indicator. Where are the P's now? Where were the P's uh, a month ago, two months ago, three months ago? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. These, this market hasn't made much forward progress in quite a while. Maybe I need to pull in my horns a little bit, okay? So if you didn't know anything about markets, just look at them on a net-net basis. Where were we? Two months ago, where are we now? And then some of you may be old enough to remember when Janet poised the question, what have you done for me lately? Okay? So the main point here is we get a sharp angle against the 50. You could have a fairly significant new trend developing. Now, what's scary is if you take a look at it in the Rusty, In the rusty, it's a really sharp angle, okay? And the reason that's scary is because this is 2,000 stocks. I use the IWM as a proxy, and I do love this indicator. Um, I guess it's an index. I guess I, I Freudian slip on that. I like, the, I like it as an indicator because it gives me a good indication of what's going on in the overall market. Now, you know me. I'm looking at 2,000 stocks daily anyway. But it's always good to have an index that's broad based like that to give you a good feel for things. And you can see the angle of inflection is pretty serious. Also, notice how tight the bow tie is, okay, in the crossover. You can see they're kind of wide and loose back here, and they didn't cross over. They kind of came together here, and they didn't cross over. Back here, they were kind of wide and loose. They threatened to come together, but they didn't, okay. But now you got the signal and you got it over a very tight area. You got that fulcrum in place. Okay, look how tight that is. It is right at the 50 day moving average. Okay, and again, not to beat the dead horse. Okay, you can beat a dead horse, but you can't drop a dead cat. I, I just don't understand that, but we'll have that discussion some other day. Uh, the angle of inflection on the 50 is pretty serious. And one more thing, too, uh, I like to talk about slope meaning that is it positive, is it negative, or is it flat? Notice you have a nice positive slope here, and you have the daylight going back to the P's here. And what's interesting is now we have daylight to the downside, and now we have a negative slope. Not that you want to just blindly rush out and sell a market because it has negative slope and daylight to the downside, but that can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Okay. All right, any questions on the 50-day moving average? Any questions on bow ties? Any questions on transitions? And when we get to the actual charts, we'll pull up quite a few, and um, we'll see quite a few. But any questions on that stuff before I get into the next segment? Okay. Whenever market goes into a bit of a transition, I like to talk, obviously, a lot about transitional patterns. And it's important to recognize those patterns as soon as possible. But the other thing I like to talk about a lot, too, is the portfolio ebb and flow. And uh, just to give credit, this is my own personal photograph. I don't know anybody photos photo. And I did not notice flow was in the, in the photo when I took it. 
It's a great ocean road down in the great country and continent of Australia. All right, let's talk about ebb and flow. And here's some things we talked about last week. I'm not going to go through them in painstaking detail, but we did talk a lot about taking partial profits. And the reason we do that is because you never know if something's going to turn into your next big winner or is going to turn into a losing trade. So it's good to take a little money out of the portfolio when you have, you know, smoke them if you got them. And again, that allows you to have your cake and eat it too. It allows you to make a short-term profit and allows you to stick around longer term if something turns out to be great. As I'm often asked, is your money in position management system statistically is it statistical or is it psychological and my answer is yes and it's psychological in that it has that 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 short-term need for fulfillment that short-term need to be right that short-term need for the immediate result in this microwave society that we talked about so much last week and weeks before that it gives me that short-term fulfillment not all the time but sometimes and that's that short-term profit okay but it also allows me to participate longer term. So occasionally I could point to a stock and say, yeah, we're up 500% in that one. So that bigger picture ego, it takes care of that. Now, what's more important than my ego and my psychology? Well, the statistical side of it is that it, it does allow you to have your cake and eat it too. I said I wasn't going to talk about it. Here I'm talking about it. See, I get so excited about all this stuff. I can't stop myself. But it does allow you to take that short-term profit and stick around in case something materializes. And you never know what's going to happen. But if you can let the ebb and flow tell you what's going to happen, your life becomes a lot, lot easier. Okay. Now, of course, we could always be wrong. So a stop is going to take you out of a position if you are wrong. A trailing stop is going to keep you in a position, hopefully, if you are right. So and this is the part I added uh, as I was doing my slides coming into the day, is that it'll keep you in potential winners because you never know where your next outlier will come from. Now, I said a trailing stop will keep you in the winner, but a protective stop, let's say a stock doesn't move at all. You get into stock and it dies and it becomes so-called dead money, which we're going to kind of beat up, beat the dead horse in a minute too. But it becomes a dead money, then later materializes just by letting that stop make that decision for you and keeping you in that position will help you out. Dave, if you have a small portfolio, you have small position sizes, does it make sense to take partial profits? That's a good question. It's kind of tough to answer. I'm going to answer from perspective perspective of saying yes, and the reason being is, you know, a big shot is just a little shot that kept on shooting. Uh, who said that? Probably, um, oh, what's his name? His name escapes me. Anyway, it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, Ziegler. Ziegler. Okay. And so I'm going to talk to talk about that from a perspective of doing the right thing and learning how to do the right thing. Okay. Um. I hear what you're saying because it's it's it, you just kind of your frictional costs are higher, and it's tougher to make it work. But I would I would try to follow the core methodology as much as possible. So as you become that big shot, you are accustomed to uh, to playing it in that fashion. Okay. Now, while I was putting my slides together, oh, question is. 10 simple, 20 and 30 exponential, 50 simple, is that right? Yeah, Robert, that's right. I don't always put the 50-day moving average in there when I'm looking at bow ties, but every now and then I like to throw it in just to, just to give you a point of reference. Okay. Uh, when I was putting my slides together this morning, and I saw that ebb and flow in there, and I said, you know, that's still pretty important. I, wanna, I think I want to continue to talk about ebb and flow today. And just for fun, I said, you know what? Let's go back in, and let's go, let's go find the peak of the market, the absolute peak of the market in the S&P 500, and let's take a snapshot of the portfolio 
on that day. And let's see what happened since and then take a new snapshot going back a couple days. Now, what happened, the reason I'm going back a couple days is because the snapshot that I made right before I thought about doing this was for an example on this position here, on this LIOX, okay? And that's going to make a lot more sense in just a few minutes. But anyway, if you go back to the exact market peak, this is what the portfolio looked like on that particular day, okay? Now, this is, um, these are the closed positions. So since that day, you had $1,600 in profits going to the closed trade column. And unfortunately and ironically, you had $2,000 worth of losses close out at a stop. So net-net, that gives you a loss of minus 400. Now, taking a look at the snapshot from a day or two ago, you're now at 98 hundred round numbers take out that 400 and now you're at ninety four hundred dollars round numbers well where did you start let's go back to slides you started at seventy nine hundred or eight thousand we'll look at it that way and now you're at ninety four hundred so you actually made money even though the market dropped about five to six percent from peak to trough during that period you made about a percent and a half, assuming you had a 100K account, by just letting the market keep you in these winning trades, okay, uh, take you out of a loser and take some profits or get stopped out of the profit on one position. Now, so my point I'm trying to make here is it's not always going to work this way and work this great, but in general, you want to follow the course. You want to stay the course, okay? So here's a case where, let's say you had a crystal ball, and you knew that that was the exact high of the market. You would have bailed out on all those longs. You'd have kept that short position, which turned into a bigger loser, okay? But you'd have kept, you got rid of all your, all your longs, and you would have kept the short on. Now, one of those shorts did work out fairly well during the time period. But one of them obviously did not. So by letting the market make decisions for you, your life gets a whole lot easier. So my point here is that, okay, you had a crystal ball. Okay, you know this is, this is the exact peak of the market. Okay. Now, assuming that you, you don't, okay, well, I'm going to rush out and sell a whole bunch of S&Ps on that day future. Yeah, obviously, that kind of hindsight works. The point I'm trying to make is you have this perfect hindsight what do you do with your portfolio? Okay? Nothing. Nothing. Let the market prune your portfolio and, and I'm going to probably beat the dead horse a little bit more on this in a few minutes, but use good stock selection to get you into some new positions. So your life is getting ready to get a whole lot easier. You need to let the market make the decisions for you. Use stops, take partial profits, and trail your stops. Let everything work out. Good, bad, or indifferent. Different. So the pressure's off. Okay? Now, let's talk about the dead money report, which, which is how I got into this whole ebb and flow discussion to begin with. A lot of people and their need to be right in this microwave society cannot stand to get into position, okay? They get into position. It does that for a couple days. What do they do? They get out, even if the stock doesn't do anything wrong. Well, again, I'm going to take the pressure off of you. Just follow the plan. Just put a stop in, and if you get stopped out, you get stopped out. If you don't, and stay with it. So this kind of makes for the mother of all examples. This stock triggers right here. And then what it does, what does it do? It dies out, tries to rally, comes in. But it didn't do anything wrong. And the whole time you had a stop down here, and it never stopped out. And a couple days ago, what happens? It takes off. It runs up 30%. Okay? 
So stick with the position, good, bad, or indifferent. So what? You had some dead money, about eight weeks worth. So what? Look at this move from this, from here to here, from here to here, okay? And Or you could say to the close, however you want to look at that. But from here to that profit target, that's about a 16% move. Let's take a look at that. 16% move, okay? Over a very short period of time, relatively short period of time. So if you made that much money on every trade over that period of time and you annualize that out, you don't own the world pretty quick, okay? Now, not everyone's going to turn into a winner. That's one thing I can guarantee. But as you can see, it pays for when it does. So I think longer term, the way you win is by following the plan. In fact, take a look at this one right here. This is one on the short side. This short was underwater for a couple of weeks, okay? Had you bailed out on that, let's just look at it based on the snapshot. Where is it today? It's up a little. But let's say 1,300 round numbers plus 1,970 equals, that's a 3,000, that's over $3,000 gain, okay? Over a very short period of time, annualize, that number is huge, okay? That's over a couple of months, uh, 3%, uh, 36. I mean, this is huge. Those are huge numbers as far as uh, absolute returns over a short period of time. But if you would have bailed out because you were underwater for a couple of weeks, you wouldn't have those big gains. The point I think I'm trying to make is that, well, it's two points, actually. One is you never know where your next big winner is coming from. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Don't just, just you can't care about where your next big winner is coming from. Know that you don't know and live with that. And then let the market tell you how to make that decision. In fact, take it one step further, have that stop in place, let the market take you out of those stinker stocks, okay? Not that you won't get stopped out and then watch in anguish as the market takes it takes off without you. That will happen. I guarantee you that will happen. But for the most part, it's going to take you out a lot of crappy trades. And it's going to keep you in a lot of good trades. So let the market do that. Is the system effective for ETFs such as MVV? This system works in all markets. This system works in all time frames. It's not the holy grail. There will be losses. Now, I prefer the daily time frame, and I prefer stock selection, stock picking. Stock picking wins in the end. See, I knew we'd talk about stock picking. The reason I like stock picking is because I can find this little inefficient stock that has a potential to make a 100% move maybe a 200% move, maybe a 300% move, or 400 or 500% move. Whereas if you're trading, you say, you say the EMVV, we'll take a look at that in one second. If you're trading an ETF, the chances are making that move are probably not that good, okay? So you're not going to get a 153% move like you did in the CLDX. Now, I know we need a few more in here. We only got one home run looking back, I don't know, if it's six or eight weeks. I'll have to go, go in and see when we closed out that CLDX, okay? And trust me, I'm working on it, so we have a few more home runs in here. And you don't know where that outlier, that home run, whatever you want to call it, is going to show up. But I can guarantee you it's going to be a lot harder to, to get that outlier on an ETF, which trades a lot more efficiently than... A stock like this, okay? When was when were this trades uh, placed? Oh no, you're on the service, right? Uh, go back in and look at the um, look at the recent ar ar archives. I think I have the dates off the screen. Um, the let's see, this one was put on a few days ago. This was a couple of weeks ago, I think, or no, less than a week ago. A couple of weeks. I mean, this is going back. A few weeks to a few months, uh, these trades. The LIOX, as you just saw, was put on was put on here. Okay, beginning of December. Okay, 
So that gives you a rough time frame. So we've been in those a few months. Okay. Oh, you're not on yet? Okay. My apologies. Okay. Okay. I'll get you those archives if you want. The, the, the shorter term archives are behind the firewall. The last 10 years are actually have been posted. I don't know if I'll put the link up yet, but if you need the link to that, just let me know. I, believe it or not, I don't get asked for the link that much. Um, okay. So again, the pressure's off. Let the market tell you what to do. Honor your stops on your existing longs. You don't have to bail out just because things are looking a little questionable overall. Once in your career, you'll bail out everything and it'll be the right thing to do. And then the other thousand times, you'll bail out everything and then watch the market take out, off without you. Or worse, in a case like this, have a couple of winning stocks take off and do great in spite of the market. To me, that's just, that's even worse. That's like rubbing salt in the wounds. Okay. MVV. I'm not sure what the MVV is. Let me see. Is that a value? Mid cap? Value something? What is that? MVV. Yeah, ultra mid cap. Uh, yeah, it'll work on that. It'll work on mid caps. Uh, keep in mind that this is a leveraged ETF, and that brings its own problems with tracking errors and all. But, you know, here's your bow tie. Here's your first thrust. Here's your trigger, your first thrust on this particular day here. Um, it's going to be more efficient. It's harder, trust me, it's harder to trade the overall market to get the overall market direction right than it is to trade something like a little biotech or like CLDX, uh, just something beautiful like that. And it's much easier, not that it's easy, but it's easier to capture that great trend in something like this, okay? You have this nice little knockout move right here. Get a nice little trigger. It kind of died at first, but hey, what do we do? We stick with it, right? Because that's how we roll. And then what happens? It turns into not the best, most impressive stock ever, but pretty darn good. I mean, if I did that on every trade, you'd probably never see my fat ass again, right? Okay? <laughs> yeah, you would. i just come back and taunt you. Okay? All right. A um, couple more things. Again, this is where I keep coming back to a couple of random thoughts I just want to leave in here. First, one day at a time. Just take things one day at a time. Um, today, the market just seemed a little sold out. And as I said in the service and I said in the newsletter, I just can't see myself as just selling into this oversold. It's just so oversold, it's dangerous to sell into. Now, of course, also dangerous to buy, and that's probably the worst thing you can do is buy an oversold market. But... It just seemed a little too sold out. We got a couple. We had a couple of shorts working, okay. And by the way, one of those shorts showed up right before the market peaked. So even though the market hadn't peaked yet, we actually started seeing some shorts show up. And that's where you listen to the database. And if you start seeing some shorts show up, even though the market is at all-time highs, then you want to err on side of the trend. You don't want to rush out and short the short everything. But sometimes it pays to pay attention to what the database is telling you. And if you really like a setup on the short side, then take it. And that's where stock selection comes in. And that's why I did the webinar last month, or actually, oh, it's almost been two months now, back in December on stock selections. Okay, a couple of announcements, and then we'll hop into individual um, your individual stock picks. So feel free to start asking now. Uh, if you don't mind, just ask about one issue on each line. And uh, any questions on trading in general, feel free to ask those now, too. And then I'll go ahead and jump into the charts. Um, but real quick, um, my stock selection webinar uh, recordings, what I have been doing with those is if you sign up for a year of the service, you get the recordings for free. Um, I'm going to put those for sale soon. I'll probably give some some time on the service if you buy the, uh, the webinar, but it's not going to be a whole year like we just did. So, But uh, keep an eye out for that. Very proud of what I did. Feedback has been phenomenal. And that sounds egotistical, but let me tell you something. When I put something out there, I get very nervous uh, and, and stressed out. And so when I get good feedback, it's just it just makes me feel great. Uh, anyway, uh, volume two of the Weekend Chart is available. So if you guys want that, uh, check my website on that. My first couple of books are relevant. If you want those, um, they're on the website. What else is going on? I think, uh, as everyone should know by now, I do have a trading service. 
and there's some information on that. Just go to my website and check that out. Okay. All right, let's take a look at what's going on in the market, and then let's uh, we'll take a look at your uh, individual stock picks. But yeah, start asking now. That's fine. Uh, as you know, I like to start with the micro in the market, and then uh, work my way out to the macro. Let's just see what list we're on here, real quick. Oops. And then you can adjust that. Okay, good. That's where we want to be. All right. First of all, as I just said, the S&P's bow tie down. Uh, always look at a blank chart first, though, okay, before start, you start putting moving averages in. And by the way, that portfolio snapshot was on that day there. The market made all-time highs, okay, closed, I think, just shy of them, but close enough. So we, I use that day as a day to look at that portfolio. And then I think this uh, this day right here or yesterday is where the snapshot was taken. Okay. Um, anyway, you can see market had a pretty serious slide. A little bit of a bounce so far today. Uh, not enough to write home about. One thing about the short side I hate is that um, you will get a lot of sharp retrace rallies, and it can be tough to um, – to hold on positions, especially longer term. Let me get Nicholas queued up. I see uh, Don's asking a bunch of questions. I think he just likes to taunt me. Okay. If you don't know who Don is, you will after a couple of these sessions. Um, anyways, peas, you can see we kind of beat the dead horse on that already. Uh, bow tie down. Look at a little ominous in here. Uh, you know, take a look at the weekly just to give yourself a little bit of perspective. Okay. It's not the end of the world just yet, but remember, it's going to turn on a daily long before it will turn on a weekly. So I would be very cautious in here. And when you go back to the daily and you see a market that looks like this, okay, big slide, bow tie down off all-time highs, you don't have to say, I'm just going to short, 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 and I'm never going to buy another long. But what you should do is, I'm going to keep an eye out for some shorts. And you know what? Those longs better be pretty darn good before I go after them. And the only area I like right now is gold. And we're going to look at that in just one second. And that hasn't been impressed me very much lately either. And that's a bit of a bummer. So there's your daily P's. Again, not the end of the world when you look at a weekly chart and you can see that we've got a little ways to go, quite a ways to go before we get a bow tie down. Okay. Your last significant bow tie down was in 2007, 2008. Notice it happened right at the beginning of 2008 and we all know what happened then. Okay. So if we get a weekly signal from up here, it could get pretty ugly. But we don't have that yet and looking at the weekly, so far, you can still draw your big arrow, and it still looks pretty good on a weekly, okay? But remember, that daily is going to turn much quicker than the weekly. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ has made a bow tie down, too. So far, pulling back a little bit. Let's get back to a blank chart. Let me clean it up. And you can see from the peak from a few weeks ago to there, and so far, just kind of pulling back. You know the routine. When in doubt, take the chart out. Okay? Do you think we have enough traders trapped above this level on the SPY? Oh, I don't know. What's enough? What do you mean by that? What, what's, what's that mean? Um, I think that you could do a little TA101, and you could see that anybody who bought at this range is a hurt and pop. And now anybody who bought all the way back here is a hurt and pop. If you if you read the Go Go Nomo article on my website, in the in that article, I drew uh, overhead resistance, which I think is pretty cool. So if you come over here to free education, and I like what I drew. I wonder if I could pull it up on a fly. Let's just see what'll happen in this experiment. Uh, go 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 Nomo. 
I'm going to embarrass myself. Watch it blow up. In that article, I drew a, a pretty cool graphic, if I say so myself, that deals with overhead resistance. And the reason I like these transitional patterns when they occur is because, where'd it go? Oh, here it is. Is because you get more and more overhead supply as the stock begins to implode a little, okay? And if this thing will come up, I'll show you. I don't know if you'll be able to see it clearly in here, but this is just straight off my website. You can download it when I'm done. And this is the graphic I want to show you here is that everybody's a winner at point A here, okay? But as this market begins to drop at point B, this purple area in here, everybody is now at a loss. And as this market begins to drop, more and more people are at a loss. And before that even happens, these people who are in this uh, uh, kind of a, what do you call it, a mustard area, <laughs> uh, they're losing open profits, so the pressure is being put on them. So the question is, is there enough people or are there enough people trapped on the wrong side of the market? I don't know. But I guarantee you there's quite a few in here. And these are your Johnny Come Latelys, those people who bought very late in the trend. They finally throw in the towel. Shoot, it's 2014. The market's been going up for how long? Long time. Since uh, 2011. Okay? And then further back since 2009, if you go further back. You know, I better buy this thing. I better hurry up and buy this market because it's going to go up forever. So that's your Johnny Come Lately mentality. But Dave, weren't you long then? Well, yeah, I'm still on quite a few things. Uh, but I've been playing it all along. I didn't just rush in a few days ago and buy the market. So how do you know if there's enough? I don't know. I don't know if there's enough or not. And that's where the pressure's off again. You don't have to try to figure out how many people are on the wrong side of the market. But do use technical analysis and read that article and look at, look at the way I described overhead supply in fact, of that into your trading, okay? Or, of course, buy the stock selection webinar because I talked a lot about overhead supply and that. Uh, Rusty, as I just said, not looking too good today, notwithstanding. Pretty decent rally, market up about a percent based on the Rusty. But it's amazing, 1% isn't that much when you look at the chart, okay? And you can see that we've been in a pretty serious slide as of late with the Rusty. The problem with the Rusty is you're going to get more and more and more overhead supply created as the market continues to drop. It's kind of like that GMCR example we're just looking at in here. So right now, from this level up, you got a lot of people, if they're still holding on, you got a lot of people at a loss. And they're waiting for this market to bounce to try to get off the hook. It's just human nature. Keep in mind that the way I approach technical analysis is basically human nature. That's all I'm doing. Now, each week I say I'm going to talk a lot about the sectors. There's really not a whole lot to say other than most sectors look like the overall market. Okay, there's chemicals, big slide, had a bit of a pop. You're going to see if you plot your bow ties, almost all of these sectors are going to be bow tying down, many of them off of all time highs. The energies are banging out new lows in here, not looking too good. I've been asked about quite a few energy stocks lately. And they look okay. Some of them look decent, okay? The stocks are being asked about. But overall, the sector's looking pretty bad in here. So you've got to really, really, really like a setup to buy it when the overall sector looks like this, okay? Just draw your arrow first. So that energy stock better walk on water or something. There better be something great about it. About the only stocks I like right now are the gold stocks. And as I've been preaching, this has been more of a process than an event. We've kind of got a sloppy bow tie off of multi-year lows here, or almost all-time lows, based on this um, index, okay? And I'm still bullish in the gold stocks, and, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully it'll work out. But again, as we get through most sectors, most sectors look like the market itself, thrust down, pull back, okay? That's a first thrust or a bow tie, however you want to look at it. Banks overall, thrust down, pull back. 
first thrust, bow tie, whatever you want to call it. There's insurance and a bit of a slide. Now, here's where I get a little concerned. If you take a look at biotech and drugs, too, you could see that they were doing okay, and then they had a deep pullback. It stalled out in its pullback, and this is what I call a micro first thrust. Again, when in doubt, let's take the chart out. And you can see you've got thrust followed by a little bit of a pullback in here. Okay? Not the end of the world just yet, but you can see that we sold off so far out of that little micro first thrust. And I call them a pioneer first thrust, too, when they're small like this. Because like the American pioneers, you're either going to get the gold or you're going to get arrows in your back when you're trading a transitional pattern. Okay? So again, as we go through most of these sectors, most again look like the market itself, thrust down, pull back, and now some of them are actually in a new leg. Some of the stronger ones like resorts and casinos are just kind of in that early phases of breaking down from that first thrust. You've got some areas like retail which have already slid pretty hard, and they're bouncing back a little bit in here, but they're certainly looking pretty ugly. Okay, And they're certainly going to have a tremendous amount of overhead resistance to, come, to overcome once they get back up there. Micro first thrust kind of action in, in the transports overall. Okay, so you can see kind of a reoccurring theme of uh, general ugliness out there. Okay, you see me broke out to all time highs. It would look pretty good. Kind of a micro first thrust down. They do have a lot of support back here, but I wouldn't buy a market at this juncture just because it has some support. Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and open it up for individual stocks. GMCR took care of that problem, that AM. This AM. GMCR, what did it do? Did it go up? Uh-oh. Well, look at that. Well, see, that's why you use stops, okay? Because this stock, well, you wouldn't have been long or short the stock, but we were, we were short back here, and we covered, I'm sure, somewhere back here somewhere, or maybe even this pop-up here. But there was no structure to this market. I mean, unless you're Don, you wouldn't be long or short this market. Where is it? 80 all the way back to there, okay? Calvin, uh, Calvin, I can't answer that because that's a setup for today. Are you on the, you're on the service. You should know that. You can't, you can't, we can't talk about stocks on the service unless they are a trigger. Uh, John, that's on my watch list for today. I can't talk about that one, but good eye, okay? Could you please recommend some ETFs since you said there are better ETFs than MVV? Well, when I say there are better ETFs, I'd rather trade something like the IWM, which is the Russell 2000, versus a mid-cap index. I'm not a big fan of mid-cap indexes and all these little special sector, t sector ETFs. What I would recommend you do is spend some time learning how to read charts and find that little gold stock that's coming off its lows, making a bow tie up that has potential off of all-time lows or multi-year lows or maybe even decade lows that has potential as opposed to trying to trade an ETF. It's going to be much harder for you to make money in an efficient ETF than it is for you to go out and put together a basket of inefficient stocks. Okay, You're not going to get, like I showed you just a few seconds ago, you're not going to get that huge 150% move in an ETF. Okay, if I can find it. It's going to be a lot harder to capture those kind of moves like this in an ETF, okay? So look for efficiency and just learn how to read charts, okay? But I would, I'd, I'd encourage you not to trade ETFs. I think, you know, there's, there's, I actually I swore I'd never write another book. I actually started writing a book a while back, and I have fits and starts with it because other projects and things get in the way. But I, I'm going to call it the, the lost art of stock selection because I think it's a lost art. All these derivative products are sucking people in, uh, ETFs, options, etc. And I think that there's a dying art out there, but I think the people who learn how to pick stocks are gonna are gonna win in the long run, and they're gonna win big. IDXX for Mr. John. John's a good stock picker, except except today. I don't know about that one. Uh, my problem with this stock is it peaked out here, and then it just it, it's barely past its prior peak in here. So I would leave that one alone unless it continues to rally up, maybe play some pullbacks along the way, should that occur. Okay. RSX as a short. 
Uh, strong, maybe. Let's back this chart way out. No. Uh, it's wide and loose longer term, and it's not coming off of major highs. Now, maybe back here, it's still a little wide and loose, but at least you're getting a transition off of major highs. But here, you're just a wide and loose stock, okay? And it's it's almost down to the support way down here, okay? So just draw your channels, draw your lines, and you can see that that's something that you probably don't want to go after. But the reason initially caught my eye was, hey, maybe so. You got to thrust down and a pullback. What are you going to get out of that? Well, maybe a swing trade to the old lows. And if that's you'd be happy with that, then knock yourself out, okay? All right, we talk about that one. URA is a uranium stock. And I've been pretty bullish on uranium. The problem with uranium is it's just hard for uranium to get started sometimes. I still like URA. It's a little wild and crazy. Oh, Dave, it looks kind of wild and crazy. It is. And now uranium is too. When it comes to commodities, you have to be a slightly more uh, lenient URA. That's what I'm trying to punch up. URZ or URA? I forget. Which one's the ETF? URA. URA. Okay, yeah, there's your ETF, and it looks okay, but it, it's a little bit too many days to pull back in here, okay? So if it doesn't take off soon, I'd be concerned about it. I'm still somewhat bullish on uranium. Um, I do give uranium stocks a little bit of a pass because they're commodity-related and they're most volatile commodity out there, okay? So it did, it did make a major low in here. It did rally up. It's pulled back. Um, I think I would pass uh, for now on this. I think there's some individual stocks that still have potential there, though. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Tono says, do most of your stocks have good open interests to trade options? For the most part, the answer is yes on that. Um, the problem with options is it opens up a can of worms. Okay. I saw that guy on Duck Dynasty. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Okay. Um, LRCX, 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 okay. Um, yeah, I'll give that a maybe. It's uh, not too far from all-time highs. Let's take a look at a weekly. Yeah, just off of all-time highs. Ideally, I like to see a sell-off off of all-time highs. Um, it's a little wide and loose. But you got a bow tie, a thrust down, and a pullback. So I would give that a maybe. Here's the deal. After today, we're going to have so many short setting up. You're going to have pick of the litter, okay? Uh, I can't tell you right now because I haven't done my analysis. But you might be able to find stocks that look a little bit better than that on the short side. Okay, uh, Tano says, what can of worms? I like it because it protects me from a catastrophe and a huge gap. Well, the can of worms is, uh, with options, is decay. And if you start doing calls and combinations of calls and spreads and butterflies or whatever, then you end up with too many moving parts. Um, which ones do you buy? There's, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of problems that uh, can occur when it comes to options. But, yeah, by all means, if you are – educated, then look at options first and decide whether or not you want to trade the underlying or if you want to do the um, uh, line. NYSE advanced decline line. I don't use that, okay? Uh, you have a symbol, we'll pull it up, but I don't use that. I don't, I, you know, I, I no longer find all that market analysis useful. I used to try to make a use for all that. Um, I think years ago I had a package called the Technician from, from Metastock, which was kind of fun to play with. And it had all this market data going back a couple hundred years or a hundred years or so, at least maybe not a couple hundred. And it was fun to play around with all that. But for the most part, I like looking at charts and looking at the indices. And I like indexes such as the Russell 2000 as opposed to trying to factor in all these indicators and advanced decline and everything else. Okay. Okay, if a trader uses your methodology and you can't outperform the overall market, say, over a two-year period, what steps do you recommend to identify the problems? Um, you probably need better stock selection, okay? You can go a fairly extended period and not outperform the market. You may have just missed an outlier. You might be very close uh, to beating the market and not realizing. You might have just missed one outlier. But the first thing I would tell you 
if you got your proper money management in place, and if you're taking partial profits, and if you're trading trailing your stops, and if you're giving things a lot of room, and if you're giving things more room as they move more and more in your favor to capture those longer term trends where the real money is, if you're doing all those things, then your stock selection could be a little bit better. Okay? It's too bad there's not a webinar on stock selection. That would be awesome. Hmm. Might have to do one on that. <laughs> but yeah, but keep in mind, you might go, you might not outperform the market every year, okay? But longer term, you're going to do just great because you'll have a year like 2008, and if you're following the methodology, you're going to make a little money, okay? You're not going to set the world on fire, but you're going to make a little money, and guess what? You're going to avoid that 50% drawdown that the average money manager went through in 2008 and you'll actually come out on top and that's going to make all the difference in the world but if you get in a market where the market kind of chops back and forth and then eventually ends higher by the end of the year you probably won't beat the market with this methodology unless you capture um, maybe one or two big winners that makes all the difference in the world but for the most part you're not going to beat the market if the market is choppy and ends the year higher, okay? That's the toughest part to do. But longer term, the trend wins. Uh, the trends don't last as long as they used to, but that's why I preach trading these transitional type of setups. PEP, -E I'm probably not going to like. Uh, that's the Pep Boys. No, it's PepsiCo. I thought it was the Pep Boys. Uh, PepsiCo, big thick stock. Uh, wide and loose and sideways. This looks like a huge range in here. It's only five points on an 80-something point stock. Look at your historical volatility. Some people call this beta. I use just HV as a measurement of beta. Um, what's the spiders right now? Spiders are 12, so it's it, your HV is almost in line with the overall market. Uh, it's just too choppy. It's almost an electrocardiogram. Uh, it's just going sideways forever. Uh, now, let me interview myself. Does it look like it's in trouble? Yes, but I think you can find something better out there to short. Okay, John wants to know about BDSI. BDSI. Um, my problem here is that it made this huge gap up, and let me just kind of measure that round numbers. That is a gap of forty-seven uh, percent. Okay. That's a little ridiculous, okay? That's just too much. Uh, in the stock selection webinar, I talked about bottle rockets where you have a stock that goes straight up, and a lot of times, more often than not, they come straight back down. So I would leave that one alone, even though it looks like it's off to the races. Just I would pass on that one. Don is here, and Don would like to know about this F and stock, F. Well, Ford looks like it's in trouble. You got a lot of overhead resistance. It's a big, thick stock. I think you can find better, but Don likes it for whatever reasons. Uh, too much overhead supply on that one. You certainly wouldn't want to buy it. But, yeah, it looks like it's still in trouble. In shorter term, draw your arrows. It looks like it's headed lower. NLNK as a long trade on the next pullback. NLNK. Okay. NLNK. Maybe. Uh, it has lost a little bit of steam in here. Notice that it pulled back and it shot up like it was going to the moon. And it kind of stalled out a little bit. It's probably a little peak in here. Let's see what's going on longer term. Okay, it is off all-time highs. So, yeah, it would have to break out decisively and then maybe on a pullback. Okay. Mr. Gary wants to know about WRPT. 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 Why is that not coming up? Let's try it one more time. WRPT. Is that right? WRPT. It's not coming up. Is there? Is it WPRT? Okay. Well, if it's WPRT, then let me just draw an arrow for you. Okay. Uptrend, downtrend, downtrend. I wouldn't short it now because it's at such low levels. On the short side, 
I much prefer to find stocks that are coming up at high levels. SLV, um, SLV doesn't look as good as GLD, and GLD doesn't look that good anymore. Um, I think silver's still trying to bottom out. The problem with these metals is it's becoming more of a process than an event. Um, so SLV is just kind of it's too sideways, shorter term to try to do anything with. But the gold stocks have been looking pretty good, and gold, the commodity, as you can see, is kind of bottomed out in here. It has been working its way higher. We do have a bow tie off of major, major lows. It's a little sloppy, okay? So it's not like a, a, a glaring, huge buy signal. But if you take a look at gold, the stocks, they look a little bit better. The, buy, the bow tie there is a little bit better. But they're going to have to take off soon, okay? I'm starting to lose a little patience with them. Okay, Wynn wants to know about Pan W, P-A-N-W. This one looks okay. Um, I'm not a huge fan of really buying anything at this juncture, so it's going to have to be a pretty exciting stock for me. Um, I think it's too many days of the pullback now, though. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty. About 14 days, about 15 days in here, 14, 15 days. So I think I'd pass based on that. And then where is it now? 60. And where was it about a month ago? 60. So even though it looks like it's a huge trend, it has lost some momentum as of late. Okay. QIWI for Mr. Phil. QIWI. Um, that looked pretty good a while back. Yeah, I think it's a little too – I think it's still in trouble – but it's already made a pretty significant move lower. I would still try to find stocks that are at a little bit higher level breaking down. And we might not be able to, okay? I'll, we'll find out um, soon, okay? Okay, James says, a related question to underperform the market with your methodology. When the market is in an extended uptrend, there are a minimum number of positions to hold. Uh, sometimes I have none or say one in three, depending on time I can devote to trading. Metamorphically, does a shotgun need to spray more bullets in order to hit more targets? Um, yeah, you need to be long as many stocks as you need to be long. Okay? Uh, that's the problem is I've got a lot of traders that are very busy people and very successful people. I often say that busy traders make good traders because they only trade when – uh, opportunities present themselves and they go off to save lives. Unfortunately, uh, some of you guys are so busy saving lives that you take a break from trading. And unfortunately, if you're trading my methodology, and trust me, other methodologies have the problems too, and I'll be happy to discuss those with you if you'd like to uh, buy me a beer one day, okay? Um, but that's one of the problems is we are looking for that outlier trade. So if you miss a couple of big home runs, then that's going to make all the difference in the world for your year. Now, as far as the number of positions, you want to have as many positions on as the market dictates, okay? So if you've got a bunch of good-looking longs, then sift through those longs and decide which one or ones you like the best, okay? And look to trade them. If you can't find a long to save your life and a bunch of shorts are showing up, then find the one or ones you like and trade them. Now, every now and then you might have a situation where you you like a sector. Let's say biotech pulls back and you can't really find any stocks within the sector that you really like, but the overall sector looks pretty good. Then, yeah, you could trade like an ETF on that sector to gain some exposure to that sector. A while back, TAN looked pretty good. That's why TAN is in the portfolio now. And in, in the discretionary portfolio, SPWR is still in there. But in the mechanical portfolio, it's not. SPWR is a solar stock, as you may know. Um, so there's no set amount, but you need to be in whatever the market dictates. Uh, usually, if a market's in a rip-roaring trend, I'll be in high single digits, eight, nine, or maybe even ten stocks. Okay? Uh, if the market gets choppy, I'll be in zero stocks. Okay? So it waxes and it wanes as far as the number of positions. But, yes, you do, within reason, you do need to, uh, as you're saying, take a more shotgun approach. Yes, I mean, better, better <coughs> excuse, excuse me, 
Metaphorically, if you want to look at it that way, sure. Okay. But I, I think I'm I'm more of a sharp shooter on a daily on day by day basis because I'm going through those two thousand stocks and I'm calling and I'm calling and I'm calling and I'm calling and I'm trying to get to the one or two, if any, that has the most potential. But in building that portfolio, it's like each day I'm building that portfolio by being a bit of a sniper. But the portfolio, I guess you, what you're saying is if you look at each one of those as a, I don't want to get into, twist up my metaphors or whatever. But, yeah, once you get a portfolio, I, I hear you, you're more of a shotgun type of approach. Absolutely. Um, but each day you need to be a sniper and pick the best of the best. And that's why when you come to these shows, I, I, I pick apart your stocks and, and, and show you everything I don't like about them, okay? And that's why it's so hard to get a high five. Because I like to pick I like to pick everything apart, and that's how I look at things. Okay, plug for Eric. Uh, no, too many days of the pullback. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, weeks and weeks and weeks of pullback. Okay. Plus, look at the HV, two hundred seventeen. That's crazy. Okay. Phil says post the child for taking partial profits. M O N T ended up with three to one on this IPO. Picked up after stock selection class. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Phil's not a plant. But, yeah, yeah, he, he uh, look at that. And look what it's doing today. Okay. So he made three to one, and then it gets stopped out. Better than the poke in the eye. You know, we looked at that AERI last week. And we talked about it being... It was our sardine stock, okay? It's just you go in, you take partial profits, you get what you get, and you don't have a fit, okay? You don't throw a fit. We had a nice little run in this one, then it came back in, okay? So what? You put some money in your account, okay? You didn't set the world on fire, but hey, in this market, that's a good thing. Exxon for Wendy. A little bit too many days in the pullback. Also, you got to be really careful with biotech right now. Biotech's getting a little iffy overall. I hear you, uh, Wendy. It looks okay. Or was it Win or Wendy? Um, but it's too many days in the pullback. LNKD. No. No, it's just wide and loose. Okay, that's an electric cardiogram. Let me get my electric cardiogram queued up. EO cardiogram. Okay, that's what electric cardiogram looks like, okay? Keep that picture in mind. Look at your stock. It's up, it's down, 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 it's up, down. Okay? Leave that one alone. The beer is frozen up here in Canada. Thanks. Most helpful. I think I'm too much of a dabbler right now. Yeah, and, and, you know, that's the other thing, too, and, and that's that's just my life. You know, speaking of beer, I was just talking with uh, one of my clients, and we talked about having a beer together. You know, it's like I've got a brewery in my garage. It's like I'm an all-in kind of guy, and, and that's just how I live my life. My wife, a couple of years ago, bought me a couple of buckets and some syrup, and, um, you know, here's your beer kit, Dave, and then I built the brewery, okay, uh, which rivals one of the local small nano breweries uh, you know he's a little bit bigger than I am but anyway I, I kind of digress but I think you have to be all in and that's just my personality and you don't want to kind of dabble in it because if you dabble in it you're going to you're going to end up with the bad and you're not going to get the good you're not going to get like you said that shotgun a few minutes ago you're going to miss those few big winners because you decided not to dabble for a few weeks because you, you were off doing something else. So you do need to be a little bit more all in. But, I mean, that's the reason why I have a trading service because I know not everyone can be there every day and be as dedicated as I am. And it's like, okay, you, you could look over my shoulder every day. You could agree or disagree with my research, but at least you got somebody out there doing the research for you. Okay, I kind of like to... CB, CB is, is part of your own personal staff out there looking for stocks and trying to find some opportunities, try to ferret out, ferret out some opportunities. So if you're not going to be, if you can't be serious because life gets in the way and you're off saving lives, then then have someone like me who's, who is serious and who's going to do the homework every day. Because you do have to do your homework 
every day, okay? <laughs> David, here the near nano brewery produces less beer than you. Thanks for today. Uh, I'm kind of low carbonate now too. It's like it's ironic. I got a brewer in the garage, but I'm low carbonate. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to get a lot of friends. Though, I tell you, you want to you want to uh, get some friends, make beer. Absolute kudos on partial profits. Many partial profits are not worried about market falling apart. Yeah, and and oh, by the way, that's something I want to say earlier. I didn't want to make it look like. Hey, the market fell apart, and I was like, oh, isn't that interesting? And trust me, I'm like, oh, crap, here we go again. I was stressed out and worried a little bit when the market began to come unglued. But then what did I tell myself? Self, do what you need to do. Watch your stops. Honor those stops. Make sure you really like the next setup that's coming along, long or short, okay? It's kind of, it reminds me of a while back. It's a few years ago. I was in my office, and my wife walks in. She's like, well, what's up? And I said, well. I'm doing pretty good. I got a lot of good positions on, but I'm not really sure what to do. And she said, what would Dave Landry do? And then she walks out, and I kind of growled a little bit, and it's like, yeah, what would Dave Landry do? And it's like, okay, well, he would honor his stops. He would trail his stop higher, and he would take partial profits as he preaches. And that's one thing that has really helped me on the educational side of my business is practice what I preach, and it makes me a better trader. So you guys, uh, you know, what was the line in, as good as it gets? You make me want to be a better trader. <laughs> you do. SSRI for Phil. Oh, Chief Orman really wound up today. Uh, that looks kind of interesting. Now, this is a silver stock. Silver doesn't look as good as gold. Uh, this one was on my list for a while, I believe. Let's see if it's coming off of, yeah, it's coming off of uh, major lows in here when you got a bow tie. So it looks like a bottom's in place here. It's a little choppy in here. It's already triggered. Okay. Now keep in mind, you're not going to get perfection with these commodities. So the charts could be a little bit more sloppier because commodities are efficient and the stocks that represent the commodities are stocks that are uh, a, a massive part of their earnings are represented by the commodity or going to be a little choppy too. Okay. But, yeah, uh, hold off if you're not already in that one. But, yeah, it looks good. Uh, looks like a major bottom's in place. Nice little bow tie in there. LRCX, we talk about that one for Lewis? Seems like we talked about it. Yeah, it looks like it's in trouble. Uh, let's see what we find tonight in our analysis. PPG? I don't know if it's a short or long. Yeah, um, want a bounce. Sure. And there's your bounce. Yeah. Um, it does have some support. A lot of see that's one problem that I'm running into right now with the overall market. Um, a lot of these issues that are just beginning to roll over, especially these lower in volatility issues um, such as PPG, is they do have a lot of support below the market. Um, if you're okay with that, somewhat limited gains because it's 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 going to likely find some support down here, then by all means take it. But you've got a first thrust that has formed. You've got a bow tie off of all-time highs. It's everything I've preached about earlier today. My only problem, again, is that it might run into some support along the way. I've been seeing quite a few interesting shorts lately, but a lot of them have uh, had some support issues. HIMX for one of the Dons. Uh, it's just consolidating in here. If you're long, stay long, but there's no reason I would go after it at this juncture. You want to look for perfection before getting into a trade, not afterwards, because you're not going to get perfection once you're in a trade. Write that down. Just follow your plan once you're in it. FDX as a possible short. FDX. Isn't uh, FedEx and UPS going to merge and call it Fed Up? Or is it? There's uh, <laughs> one I can't say. It's kind of sexist. It's a uh, UPS and uh, another one. Um, yeah, it looks like it's in trouble. And it looks like it doesn't have support for a while. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you an okay on that one. Big, thick stock. Doesn't move around a whole lot. You might be able to find something a little bit more inefficient. But sometimes on the short side, when these efficient stocks begin to crack, they crack pretty quick. And you do have a mountain of overhead resistance. So from a technical analysis standpoint, I can't beat it up too much. And you don't really have any meaningful support for a while. 
well, it's 15 points away. It's not that far away. Um, but I'm going to give you an okay on that one. A-N-G-I for Don. Don is probably long, A-N-G-I. AGI is not too bad. Uh, I don't like the gap down, and it's got some overhead supply here around 20. Uh, I don't see any reason to go after that. Okay, Art says RSO long, RSOL long. Just look at the stock to get back to about 450 or up 50 percent, 60 percent in two weeks, assuming the market doesn't fall apart. Okay, RSOL. Uh no. It's kind of all over the place. I don't, I don't see any reason why you want to go after this stock. It's up. It's, you see, this is the bottle rocket I talked about back here, and then it breaks out and it comes back in, and it go, takes off. Um, let this just leave it alone, and someday it might just die out and kind of base and come down here like those solar stocks did a while back, and then take off again, and then you want to get into it. But right now, it's a bit of an electrocardiogram. Pot for Don. I think he's going for. The um, Nicholas Fine Award of the Day. And let's break out Nicholas. No. And the reason I say no is because I drew an arrow last week, the week before, the week before, the week before, and it's just going sideways in here. You also have this big gap down. Again, Don. F L I C. Yeah, here's a stock that's beginning to break down, but notice that it's very thin. So it'd be very hard to try to short this stock, okay? But absolutely, it looks like a stock that's in trouble, but just way too thin to even think about trading, okay? But yeah, it's in trouble. I mean, if you can borrow it, the only problem with borrowing a stock that thin is, man, if somebody comes in and wants to, wants to stomp on it and screw you up. Yeah, FTX has a low HV, and that's one of the things I was complaining about. But on the short side, you could be a little bit more lenient with HD, HV because they slide faster than they glide. Uh, anybody, I don't, I don't remember what GME was on the long side, but it wasn't that. It was fairly low in volatility. It's pretty high now at 62. But it was fairly low in volatility, and we went after like NCR a while back. It didn't work out, so I guess it's not the greatest example in the world. But on the short side, you, you can short socks that are a little bit lower in HV and you're looking for that expansion in the volatility on those. Okay, Wynn says, does the gold sector have a reversal relationship relation to the whole market in the past? Oh, I don't know. Let's. I guess you could plot the S&P and then plot gold. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of intramarket analysis, but I do recommend that you uh, – you do read Murphy's book, which is, it's on my website, uh, Intermarket Technical Analysis, and you can see it, um, you can check it out on my website, GLD. But yeah, just for S and G's, uh, gold versus stocks, you got gold in the background, you got stocks in the foreground. I mean, you can study that relationship if you want. The problem is, with Intermarket Technical Analysis, that even Murphy writes about in his book, is there's long lead and lag times, okay? So... Gold might be suggesting, I don't know, a top in stocks, but stocks might go sideways for the next year before they finally top, okay? So it's hard to, it's hard to trade one off the other, but you can, you can see that it was definitely an inverse, a pretty good inverse relationship right in here, okay? And then notice that gold peaked right as the market bottom there, okay? So there might be something there, just very, very, very hard to trade off of, and that's why I just focus on individual issues and say, hey, I like this gold stock. Let's go after this gold stock. It looks pretty good. Okay. JVA coming up on your screens. Needs a pullback now. JVA. Uh, not yet. It hasn't come up on my screens yet. No, because it's too thin. I don't have scan set that low. I mean, if I could clone myself, I mean, maybe I should hire a bunch of guys and say, you, this is what I want you to do, and you, this is what I want you to do. I mean, maybe there's a market for these super low-cap stocks like this, okay, within reason. Uh, it's take it off, maybe on the first little pullback, but it's going to have a lot of bad memories along the way, and it's also just really too thin to go after. Or be super-duper careful if you do. 
I mean, you know, not to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but as a private trader, yes, you can be a little bit more nimble and you can do some of these things and you can exploit some of these edges. Like every now and then, I'll recommend a stock that's fairly liquid in my service. And even though it's liquid, because of the volatility, I'll get a, a high five from an RIA and he'll just say, yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't take it because of, the, because of my charter or because of the way I run the money. I can't take the more speculative issues like that. But, hey, as a little guy, you can do what you want. Okay, I'm reading David and Goliath now. I mean, before I even read it, I know it's going to say it's going to say that as a little guy, you have some advantages that the big guy might not have, and you do. But um, but that's but be careful when you get that thin of a stock when you get well below 100,000 shares. Just be super careful. ZNGA as a long ZNGA. I haven't seen it in my scans or anything. Uh, no, because you got this one big gap up here. And then you didn't get past the old highs. And then you got electrocardiogram longer term working. Maybe if it breaks out to new highs decisively and begins to trend, want to pull back. But certainly not at this time. Did we talk about that one, Doc? I don't know. RGLD. How you been, Doc? I haven't seen you in a while. Um, yeah, I like these goals in general. Let's see if this was coming off of all-time lows. I would prefer the ones coming off of all-time lows. As opposed to this one, notice we're long NG, and there's another one we're long that might even be better. A and V, okay? Notice how A and V made these multi-year lows, or almost pretty much all-time lows, for all intents and purposes, okay? So that's what the longer-term stock chart looks like. If we zoom in a little bit, and we put, like, bow ties in, you could see that you made a major bow tie. You made a bow tie for all-time lows, and what have we been talking about this whole webinar? Bow ties off of all-time highs, bow ties off of all-time lows, no guarantee. You want a guarantee, go buy a toaster. But a lot of times you get a major turn after a bow tie off of all-time lows. So this is why we bought A and V. This is why I like A and V at this juncture. Uh, RGLD, again, not quite at such low levels. Uh, if you back the chart way, way out, you can see it's still at fairly high levels, at least historically, okay? Now, let's zoom in and pick it apart a little bit more. I mean, it looks okay, uh, but it's not set up just yet. Now, remember, I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to these uh, commodity-related stocks. But, yeah, I hear you, Doc. Uh, you got your bow tie in here. You had a little cup and handle action back there. Uh, looks pretty good. Maybe in the next pullback. But I would be more inclined to look at those smaller cap gold stocks. Some of my peeps are long GDXJ. I, uh, I threw it out as an ancillary setup. If you don't want to take a chance and go after those super-duper speculative gold stocks, this is one case where maybe an ETF might be worthwhile because look at your HV on this ETF. That's 48. That's pretty big HV, okay, historical volatility. Kind of made a cup and a handle as I drew in here, kind of made a bow tie. It's not perfect, but you're not going to get perfection in these commodity stocks again. Uh, John says, would you say avoid stocks for less than 100K volume and refer to 90 day? Uh, 30 day or 50 day, you could use either one. I have some scans that have 30, some days have 50. My original scans all had 50, but uh, in time I think I, I whittled that down to 30. So I would stick with 30. Mr. Jeff wants to know about CFM, CVM, sorry. Um, well, it's a penny stock, so I'd be careful about that. A um, lot of overhead. It has pretty good volume, but keep in mind, it is a penny stock. So, I mean, it's a million shares on average. Pretty good volume. Uh, I think it would pass. Now, that overhead's a ways away, but I think it's just a little too speculative, even for me. Okay? I would pass on that. Not that I would always avoid. There's, like, some low price goals in here that I think are okay. Okay, so yeah, Jeff, I mean, I hear you. It looks like it's bottomed out, but I would pass. Okay, ALG for Phil. Uh, yeah, is it possible short? No, too thin, too thin, way too thin. Look at that, 27 on average. Is this, uh, I don't know what that is. But yeah, I mean, I hear you. It looks like it's in trouble. EXK. Uh, yeah, that's a gold stock, actually a silver stock. Let's take a look at it long, long term. 
Um, eh, it's tough to it's tough to really pick apart because it is a lower price stock, but at least it's coming off of multi year lows. I don't know. I think I'd, I'd find a gold off of all time lows as opposed to this. I hear you. It's kind of bow tied. It kind of looks like a bottom. Uh, it's okay. I think I think you find better than that. Uh, uh, Hong wants to know about S U N E as a long. S U N E. Let's take a look at that. I hope I got your name right. Um. Well, it looks like it's trying to break out, but we don't play breakouts, okay? So where was it months ago? Where was it two days ago? It hasn't really gone anywhere in three or four months. But wait to see if it breaks out and then look to play the first pullback. My scans are going to start picking this up. Now, keep in mind, I look at a lot of stocks anyway, so this is actually one I look at daily. But when I get to my scanning part, or the, when I do my scans, this stock makes a new high here in a couple days, today, maybe even today. It's going to come into my scans, and I might even put it in my momentum list if it's making new highs with vigor. But that doesn't mean I'm going to trade it just yet. So it's going to have to break out, make new highs, hopefully with vigor, and then I'll look to play uh, pullbacks along the way. Andre says short AES at 13.50. AES, that's going to be a utility. Uh, no, these utilities are a little too wide and loose for me, most of them in general. It's kind of all over the place, kind of electrocardiogram. So I would leave that alone. LG, uh, no, it's another utility. It's just draw your arrows there, okay? PCLN is a short, probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. You made a marginal new high here. You're beginning to break down, okay? Yeah, that's that's the mother of all tops there. That stock looks looks pretty uh. Pretty good. Who gave me that? I'm gonna give you a high five. First high five of the day. It's not bad. I mean, I'm sure I could pick it apart if I had more time, but first glance, and sometimes that's your best glance, is uh, yeah, it sounds like looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Just make sure you wait for entry on that one. We get a lightning round. We'll go through a couple of more in here. RE for John. That's probably gonna be uh, short because it is an insurance company. Um, no, it's it, it's a little kind of choppy in here, maybe on a bounce. I mean, take a look at AON, which we are short now, and notice that it's just coming off these all-time highs. It kind of basted here. Now it's beginning to break down. It had a little pullback, nice little trigger. So even now it still looks pretty good as a possible short, whereas the RE is kind of a little bit uh, choppy, okay? So I like an I like an ARN versus an RE, but I hear you. RE is certainly in a downtrend, but you don't want to short it just because it's in a downtrend, okay? Ace, ARCP has set up a trigger around 1380. This right? ARCP. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just I'm not really crazy about trading REITs, okay? Um, Although REITs are about the only thing that's kind of going up in here. I hear you. It looks okay, but I'm not that excited about REITs again. And it's got a lot of bad memories back here, so and it's kind of wide and loose, although it did bottom out. I hear you. Um, I think I'd pass on that one. Okay. Okay. Alvin says F-L-I-C. F-L-I-C. Sounds like a bank. Yeah, no, it's too thin. We talked about that one. But, yeah, I mean, good eye on that. Absolutely good eye. ALU. I think we need to go ahead and wrap things up. Um, this is a foreign stock, so it can chop around a lot. I think it would pass. It, it bow tied down, and then now it's bouncing back to its prior highs. Um, maybe keep an eye on it, see if it, it stalls out again. It's going to be hard to short because it's less than 5 bucks. Depends on your broker. But, no, I would leave that one alone, long or short side. WHR, I'm not a huge fan of these big conglomerate stocks or big um, brick-and-mortar stocks. But but when they begin to break down, they can break down pretty good. It's a little it's a little choppy. I probably wouldn't go after it because it's a little too choppy, okay? But I certainly hear you. It's broken down. It looks like it could be in trouble. Uh, it's just kind of wide and loose and choppy the whole way. But I hear you. It looks like a top is in place there, uh, for sure. So, yeah, it looks pretty ugly. Well, look, we're at the hour and a half mark, so I need to go ahead and wrap things up. You know how I feel. I love these uh, I love doing these shows. I'm just flattered that you'll be here and listen to me. 
Uh, not my way or highway, of course, of course, but uh, just uh, one man's opinion, and I could be wrong. But uh, I, I really do enjoy these shows. Thank you guys for showing up. Without you, there is no show. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email, and I will try my best to get back with you. And if not, it will be fodder for next week's show. If we don't talk, uh, everybody have a great weekend, and then uh, see you guys hopefully again next week. Thank you so much.